excited today to have Dan McManus from Department of Water Resources with us. And um, he's going to talk about the drought. He's going to tell us how to vote. He's going <laughs> to... All the things that DWR does, yeah, right? Awesome. Okay, so thank you again for being oh, here. No thanks, well, thanks, for, yeah, thanks for having me. I want to um, talk a little bit about uh, the aquifers in, in the area and, and statewide, how they're responding to the drought conditions that we're experiencing. And then also, um, you probably have heard about the new sustainable um, groundwater management act that was passed on um, September uh, 16th, I believe. And so that's changing kind of the, uh, the ground rules for how we are going to manage groundwater in California for, for many years to come. And uh, so I want to go over that a little bit um, in, in some detail. Um, and it, yeah, anyway, i got about 50 slides, so, yeah, hold on. Um, <laughs> anyway, so overview, yeah, groundwater demand, we're gonna, I'm going to talk a little bit about that, just, and then try to put in perspective just how dry is it this year uh, versus some of the other years. And then, as I mentioned, the uh, aquifer response to drought conditions, the uh, Sustainable um, Groundwater Management Act, and then um, some uh, sources of information which, um, you know, our, our website, we're, up, we're updating our Groundwater Information Center website, and um, anyway, we're, we're adding a, a whole bunch of new cool stuff there, interactive maps where you can click and have different layers for different um, things to look at. So first of all, uh, groundwater use. Um, this is a map we did for the California um, uh, Water Plan um, 2013 update. Um, the last few versions of the California Water Plan didn't have a whole lot of groundwater, so we took it upon ourselves, um, since we weren't funded for both 118 over the last 10 years, to kind of hijack that and, and put a bunch of groundwater information in. So, drought volumes 1, 2, and 3, there's some groundwater information. Volume 4, which will be in it, is 1,000 pages. So, we, it's a pretty uh, big compendium of, of groundwater information. And this is one of the uh, state slides showing um, groundwater use um, in the blue bars versus their um, the uh, total water supply for that particular area. And since it's the water plan, it's it divided up into um, hydrologic regions. And so you can see for the Sacramento River, um, and these are thousands of acre feet, um, about, uh, that's, so that would be 2.743 um, uh, million acre feet of groundwater used with a, uh, with a total supply somewhere around um, 9 million acre feet. And then the little pie is a breakdown of all the hydrologic regions. So you can see which one uses the most groundwater, and you can see at Flurry Lake at about 38% is the biggest uh, groundwater pumper. Um, Sacramento, about 30%. And California statewide, we have about 16.5 million acres feet of groundwater that's used annually. Um, and, and once again, so the way the California Water Plan is done, as I mentioned, by hydrologic region, and then also the way our, our data is collected is by um, what they're called uh, detailed analysis units, which are, are smaller. And then it rolls up into planning areas, and then it rolls up to hydrologic regions. So these are planning areas. Um, it's too bad we can't all get on the same page as far as our boundaries go. But yeah, unfortunately, the only one of these planning areas that, that coincides with the groundwater basin is, is kind of a Calusa um, uh, basin here. But you can see these are the numbers, the different planning areas. Uh, once again, the groundwater use versus their total supply. And you can see you know, the, uh, the average groundwater use for the, the Sacramento Valley in these areas, um, you know, 522,000 for Clusa, um, 566 for the for the Yuba um, uh, planning area. So uh, quite quite a bit of water um, groundwater being pumped um, right here or, where we stand out of the basin. And then if you look at the percentage breakdown, I think we've got about 21 percent of the of the uh, groundwater is coming from Deep Sutter. Um, Anyway, so that kind of gives you just a, an overall perspective of, of what we're using on an annual basis. And this does fluctuate, as you can imagine, during dry years and, and wet years. Um, and so how dry is it? I mean, you probably some of you have seen the, the, the pictures of uh, the different reservoirs. This is Folsom. This is actually Folsom in January, um, before we um, received the, the rains that we got in, in February or March. Yeah. Um, and then uh, these are some slides of uh, Oroville and then... Um, Shasta, um, you know, our, our, once again, our, our drought webpage um, said this is the third driest in as far as precip goes. Um, this is a great little graphic you can get from our CDEX site, and what they do is um, they combine and, and they have an interactive one of these two, so you can pick whatever water year you want to look at to see how it did. And so, um, one of the ways we we measure and try to evaluate the water conditions are, are through these uh, precip stations. Um, and we have uh, eight of them that are kind of our 
benchmark precip stations for the um, Sacramento River hydrologic region, and they call that the eight station index. And they combine all those and you look at the precip amounts. And these are the, the months of the year. The first the water year um, starts in October, ends September 30th. So we just ended a year here. Um, and here we are in, in the current water year. And you can see it's the, uh, the third driest. Um, we got 76, 77. Um, this is uh, 23, 24. And then here we are here. And you can see why people were getting a little nervous in February. Um, we are just flatlined. And then March and April, you know, fortunately we got some rains, which is another really great thing for, for groundwater. We've kind of found that, you know, given two water year types, same amount of precip, if you have um, most of it coming in, in March and April, um, it, it's much better on the aquifer than if, if the majority of it came in the fall. Um, you know, it, it kind of pushes back the irrigation demand in, in some areas a little bit. So you don't, um, people aren't pumping quite as early. But anyway, you can see it's, it's a pretty critical, critically dry year. And the other way we uh, look at how the, how the water year is doing is we look at runoff. And, uh, and there's an a, a index for that, Sacramento Valley Water Year Type Index. Um, it used to be called the 40-30-30 index. Um, and what they do is they take the um, unpaired flow estimate from the Sacramento River above <coughs> Bend Bridge, um, uh, in the north, uh, Feather River at Oroville, Yuba River at Smartville, and American River before, um, before below Flo Folsom Lake, and they um, they take that. They take about forty percent of the current year or current year of April through July, and thirty percent of the October through March, and then they also want to consider some of the um, holdover uh, amount from the previous year. So they take thirty percent of that. And they come up with an index and they apply that to every year and that gives us a nice standard way to compare water year types. And if you look at the, um, and so what you have here is a breakdown between wet, above normal, below normal, dry and critical. So you can see there's, there's no real normal here. <laughs> it's either above or below. But um, for 2014, the red one here was a critical year and it was um, 4.05, it was the fourth lowest on, on record going back to uh, 1906. So it's pretty, uh, pretty dry. And for the San Joaquin Valley, um, they have a similar type um, index. Um, of course, different watersheds, they look at runoff. But that one, um, uh, 2014, 1.16, that was the number one lowest since 1901. So down in the, the southern part of, of the valley, Central Valley, they're experiencing the, uh, the worst uh, year as far as precip goes. The other thing to look at, um, this is a graphic we did for the water plan. and. Uh, and the water plan years um, only go um, from 2005 to 2010, so um, uh, this stops there. But you can, and my feeling is these trends probably continue um, from 2010 to, to now since we've been so dry. But, but these are um, contours of depth to uh, water, and you can see how the depth of water gets, gets really, uh, really deep here. This is, um, oh, this is changed, I'm sorry, changing groundwater elevation 2005 to 2010. And you can see this is, um, I think that's 60 feet of change um, just in those few years. And then what we did is to try to calculate a volume of uh, change in storage. Um, you know, for those of you doing the groundwater thing area, you, you got to come up with a specific yield, which you can argue for years over what specific yield value to use. And so we we're kind of getting in the stalemate over that. So we said, well, let's pick the, the brackets. And we picked um, point. Um, 07 as the, as the lowest value we'd anticipate to find in the valley on an average, and we picked 0.17, which would be the highest. And we, and we feel pretty safe that you know the, the change in storage is somewhere in between there, and, and at least it gives you a range to look at. So if you look at the Sacramento River, we lost about um, somewhere between 0.7 and 1.7 million acre feet um, storage to groundwater use. The San Joaquin um, uh, River uh, area here. Um, one to 2.6 million acre feet, Tulare Lake 3.7 to 8.9, and if you look at the Central Valley the total, that comes about 5.4 to 13.2. Um, um, and so, if you can translate that trend to continue, um, you know we probably since 2005 have, have lost somewhere between 10 and 20 million acre feet out of, out of the um, Central Valley as far as uh, groundwater goes. When I say uh, um, change in groundwater, um, a lot of people abbreviate say changing groundwater storage, you're not really changing the storage, you're changing the amount of groundwater in storage. 
I don't know how many reporters get that mixed up. And people go, oh, we don't have any more storage. I'm like, no, the storage is still there. I'm just, it's the groundwork that's not there. Um, the other graphic we uh, did for um, you know, the governor's proclamation, they, they had DWR do a, a report in April, and then we have another one in November. And for that, we started, we kind of got in this groove of doing dot maps, which are kind of like, and we looked at what is the, um, what was the difference between what we saw before as a historic spring low in groundwater levels, and we've used 1900 to 1998, and then versus what is the current, you know, kind of a dry period we're in, 2008 to 2014. And so what you see here is um, change in water level, um, historic low versus current low. And um, I kind of blew up the legends here so you can see it, but the purple here is a historical low greater than 100 feet. And you can see, uh, and these are the actual number of dots um, or the percent of uh, wells that are experiencing that. Not too many, but you can see in the Tulare Lake and, and Southern San Joaquin um, Valley, there's a number of purple dots there, greater than 100 feet below whatever our historic previous low. That, that's a lot. Um, Next one here is 50 to 100 feet. You can see the red starts um, uh, you know, spreading out a little bit. Not too many reds up in the valley here where we're at, um, but most of them fall within this, this gold area, which is zero to 50 feet of uh, difference. Um, so at the, and, and for, that's about, you know, what, 45% of the wells fell in that, in that territory. The other way um, we looked at, of course, is, is the land subsidence. And we knew that we were seeing a renewed subsidence in the Tulare Lake and San Joaquin Valley. Um, you know, unfortunately, uh, you know, we had the subsidence in the uh, 60s and 70s. They brought water down there, and they had all these extensometers. And everybody thought, oh, subsidence is done. And a lot of them um, ended up going to disrepair and, and not um, being available. Fortunately, we have some other methods we can use now. But when they started doing some, some basic surveys, they saw um, quite a bit of uh, renewed subsidence up to a foot a year in some areas and then a lot of new areas experience subsidence. So what we thought we'd do is um, take a look at, and this is a very complicated map, so I'll provide a copy of the presentation. You guys might want to look at this later. But um, so, so we decided to, to try to look at the estimated potential for future um, land subsidence. And so we have this kind of um, color range for each of the basins from lower to higher. Um, and obviously, if they've experienced subsidence and we see declining groundwater levels, that's going to be a higher. Um, and so you can see the whole San Joaquin Valley. But then we also have these little stars of recent subsidence, historical, and then um, historical and recent, and then just historical. Um, and then same thing here with, with a larger area. And, and the blue is the historical and recent areas that, that have come in. Um, but the other thing is, is there's this whole array now of continuous GPS um, subsidence or uh, ground elevation uh, stations around. And we looked at that data and, and we're surprised to see that we actually are showing um, some subsidence right along the uh, 99 corridor. Um, you know, here, um, this is actually the, the CDF station on 99, which I gotta figure out what's happening there. <laughs> but, um, but anyway, not much, but you know, roughly uh, an inch there of, of subsidence. But we definitely are, are seeing it in, in some other parts of the uh, Sacramento Valley. So, you know, bad year for, for groundwater. Um, so what's going on with groundwater levels? Um, this is our monitoring grid for the Sacramento Valley. We've got over um, 700 wells, and they're kind of a mixed bag of um, uh, dedicated observation wells. Um, and those dedicated wells typically consist of like three wells, a nested set, a shallow, a middle, a deep um, well. Um, and they have data loggers that collect data uh, every hour on the hour, and those are all available online if you want to look at that data. But, but so we have a, um, dedicated wells, we have domestic irrigation, and then just kind of this other group of wells that are stock wells or abandoned wells or whatever. Um, and so what we do is we kind of group these to look at the aquifer conditions. You know, you can't add all the shallow wells and deep wells together to do um, your contouring and, and look at elevation. You have to kind of group them. And, and so we look at wells less than 200 feet, and then we um, um, look at wells in an intermediate zone, 200 to 600 feet, and then we look at a deep zone. And, and this zone, you might think, you know, well, it's a big, it's a big range. We know the aquifer is quite variable, and you know, it's, it, it's that is not like the whole bathtub. But, but what we're seeing is a lot of the uh, ag wells that are drilled 
um, they're screening across multiple intervals all the way down. So even though you may have at one time had a discrete interval at 200, 250 of, of gravel, you know, it's behaved kind of independently, um, what we see now is just this intermixing through all the wells in there. So um, surprisingly, when we, when we contour this um, for the groundwater elevation contour, um, it, it comes out uh, pretty decent. So anyway, we, we look at um, groundwater um, elevation change maps, similar to a dot map, um, uh, to compare the previous year. And then also, we looked at, we wanted to go back to the, what was the last normal water year we had, really? And, and for us in the groundwater world, um, looking at the data, it was about 2004. So what you see, is we want to go through a series of, of contour maps showing the change from um, last year to this year, but then also from 2004 to 2014. And, and then I'll show you some hydrographs because um, the change maps only get you so far. They're, you know, it's a nice regional look at, at the changes, but you need to drill in to, and look at the actual hydrograph to see specifically what's happening with that well, you know, from a seasonal and a long-term standpoint to look for trends. So this is a, a summer 2013 to summer 2014 um, uh, change map. And, uh, and, and so we have these uh, kind of color variations here you can see. Um, and, you know, um, and these are boxes here are, are statistical breakdowns. I think on a couple of the slides I, I expanded those so you can see them a little better. But they show you what was the maximum um, decline, what was the uh, number of wells in that data set for that county. It's a nice little statistical breakdown. But um, in general, what you see is over the last year, you know, somewhere between 10 and 20 feet of decline between this summer and last summer. Um, and Chico is right there. This is uh, um, Glen County. And, and this is, uh, uh, you know, we have one Clusa Irrigation District kind of sneaks down the side here. They have surface water. These guys don't have any surface water. Um, they have some opportunities for surface water, but, but this year they were cut back with, with hardly any supply. So we, we see um, depressions here fairly frequently, and then also on the west side of Tehama County. And I gotta say, largely that's because in these areas on the west, or on the western edge of the valley, people are putting in almond orchards, quite a few of them, where they never have before. I mean, that, that ground has never been um, even irrigated hardly, and now they're using groundwater. So if you look at the same, um, same zone, oh crap, that was a shallow zone. Um, that was less than 200 feet. Um, same zone, you go back 10 years to the summer of 2004, things are looking pretty uh, bloody here. Um, yeah, so you got over 40 feet um, in this area. Um, let me see if I can pick out the, uh, the maximum on that. Oop. Uh, what did I do? Um, yeah, I want to say that looks like 59 might be the, the maximum in the middle there um, for that 10 year period. Um, and once again, these are the, the, the shallow zones, which you'd expect um, maybe they wouldn't be impacted as, as heavily, you get surface water recharge going on. But, but anyway, uh, and, and this is the Chico area, you can see in Durham, we, we typically get a pretty good depression um, in the Durham area. And then north of Chico, um, this is all groundwater used through here. I don't know if you've driven north of town lately, but they completely cleared a bunch more fields, and I'm not sure what they're going to do, but it looks like orchards going in again, probably, you know, hundreds of acres. So I've got some uh, arrows here, one, two, three. I want to show you some hydrographs for each of these little um, depression areas. And this is, uh, this is one hydrograph here. Um, it's a, a residential well. Um, and, and so here's 2004, and you can see the change. Now seasonally, a uh, thing to look at in these maps too is, is the scale, because they will change if you try to keep the graph on one page. So this is a 10 foot um, interval here. So you can see this is um, summer, um, uh, you know, 94 to um, whatever, probably about 64. So we got about a 30 foot, foot change there. Um, this trend here um, is not real good, but uh, but it is a drop. So you hate to, you know, it's hard to, to gauge whether things are um, going to be sustainable with the management practices during drought. But, um, but hopefully you'd like to see during some, some wetter years. I think you had um, 2006 in here. Yeah, it, it kicked up a little bit more this way. Uh, second hydrograph um, looks a little worse. Um, uh, these are once again 10 foot. 
Um, this is on the west side of the valley. Um, and this is where they brought in surface water supplies over there. You saw how you can see how the aquifer really responded after they got surface water supply. Um, that lasted for a while, um, became expensive, and they had cutbacks. And now we're right back where we were in the 70s, late 70s over there. So that's, that is not a good trend right there. And once again, um, so number three here, these are 20-foot um, contour inter um, intervals here on the scale. So you can see some, some wells have a little um, broader seasonal variation. I should mention these are spring levels, and then typically with either, um, either summer or fall um, down the bottom. So moving down the aquifer, 200 to 600 feet, this is kind of the, the bread and butter part of the aquifer where most wells pull their, their water. Um, you can see, um, there's a little blow up here, once again, the west side of, of, of um, Glen County over here, and I think I put here, yeah, the, um, the maximum decrease there is about 38 feet, and for Butte County, we saw a maximum decrease of about, about 19 feet um, associated with the Durham area. And this is just a one year, this is just a one year decrease there. If you look at the uh, 10 year, things get a little worse as you'd kind of expect. Um, and for the, um, the Glen County, the same area over there really expands, and I believe that's 90, 96 feet, um, 10 years of, of, of drop over there. That's in Glen, you say? Yeah, that's Glen County. Yeah, so once again, I should point out this is Chico, um, uh, Orland, and this is kind of a southern um, or middle of Glen County there. Orland Artois, if you're familiar with that area. Um, and then uh, in Inclusa, we also are seeing um, some pretty big declines around Arbuckle and, and down in this area um, where they put in a lot of uh, orchards. Hydrographs for that, um, same kind of thing. This one has a little more seasonal fluctuation. These are 10 foot intervals, once again. Um, but you, know, you can see your, your definite downward decline um, here. And usually just, just Kind of a tip for those if you're looking at hydrographs and trying to compare it year to year i know we're, we're looking at summer to summer but if you're really looking at year to year we look at spring to spring in spring the, the water levels are more stable you know people haven't started irrigating and that's the time really to come to, to do some critical comparison but this is the latest data set we have what are the questionable measurements oh yeah so questionable measurements is if um if the well's pumping you know it's a questionable measurement if, um, and, and it's a good point, so I'm gonna bring, show you a little mistake we made in one of the maps, but, um, so pumping wells aren't included in our, in our contour analysis, but there are other times we'll get up there and, and the well will have oil, a lot of ag wells, they, they lubricate their, their bearings with oil, and so, you, you know, you don't know how much oil is sitting on top of that water column, um, so we put a questionable measurement for that. Um, we also, if the well, if we know that the well is recently shut down, that's a questionable measurement, or if there's a nearby well pumping, um, and this year, every well was pumping, so it's a little tough. But um, that's once again why in summer or looking at spring um, level, you see very few questionable measurements in the spring. Um, if you're going to compare this, that's a better time of year to do that. But once again, you see the same trend, you know, um, going down. You can notice too that wet years, um, maybe not as much seasonal variation, fluctuation as, as you get in the dry years. They're really, um, um, you know, putting a lot of demand on that aquifer. Uh, next hydrograph, stepping down, um, uh, not not too bad of a trend. These are um, these are ten foot intervals again through here, uh, not as bad as we see in some of them. And then uh, this this is a, um, these are fifty foot intervals. So once again, this is this is not a good scenario. And this is probably in the, in the Glen County area or in Arbuckle, I believe. Wait, yeah, thirteen. This is that uh, Arbuckle area in Calusa that's dropped a, a ton. And then. Um, Wells greater than 600 feet. This is the one I wanted to show you that we need a correction on, and I'll explain that in a minute. Um, but we don't have a whole lot of wells. These are mostly our, our dedicated um, observation wells that we've put in and are trying to measure that lower aquifer. Although I will say, um, you know, uh, there's some irrigation districts that are putting in deeper wells to pump the lower parts of the aquifer. The thought there was that. I thought there originally was that if you pump the lower part of the aquifer, it, it doesn't impact as much the surface water systems, and that's true to an extent, but ultimately, you know, every drop of water we come, get out of the ground comes from the surface at some point. Um, it might just be more of a delay, and, and, you know, what we're pumping today here may take 50 years to show up, who knows. But, um, so here, what, what we have is a big rebound. 
Um, you know, and this is on um, 13 to 14. Um, and this is the one I, I said is a little bit of an error. I want to show you the hydrograph for that. Um, and this is because it's the um, the um, the modern well right next to the GCID pumping well. So it, although it's not pumping, um, these really it's so close that it's measuring the levels like you know, and I think it's maybe um, 50 feet away from that well or 100 feet. So really, in this one, if you want to look at the rebound, you, you can't go to the pumping level. You'd have to go back a little bit and look at a static level. And so that that previous one, instead of a a hole here showing about 40 to 50, it should be showing about 20. Um, but it does still show that it came back. And last summer, GCID pumped as well as part of a water transfer program. And we're seeing the recovery from that still um, now. Um, as you uh, go down, once again, this is uh, the 10 year one for wells greater than, than 600 feet. We, once again, we don't have too many wells um, greater than that. and. Um, in this area, we, we know that they also have deep wells. They're, they're drilling deeper all the time to, to get um, water. And I believe the maximum there looks like about 37 feet. And there's the hydrograph, which 10-foot um, interval. And this is uh, another kind of disturbing trend. Um, you know, you don't, you don't want to see this. And hopefully the new legislation will, will get people thinking about these trends and, and making changes. So. Um, so another thing we have that came up is the cash jam program. I'm not sure if folks are, are familiar with that. It's the California Statewide Groundwater Elevation Monitoring Program. And that came in in 2009 with a, a big slug of other legislation that required groundwater um, reporting for ag areas and, and some other things. Um, but one of the things that it requires is that people have uh, kind of a minimum monitoring density in the basin. And that monitoring entity step up to do monitoring or they're not eligible for grant funds. And what you, when we took a look at it this year, and we also had to do a, a, prior, a basin priority. Uh, we had to prioritize all the basins as high, medium, low, or very low. And we did that on, on a, a bunch of different criteria, but in general, um, I guess the biggest factor was, was on demand, you know, groundwater use. Um, and so you can see that um, these are all the high and medium um, priority basins, and these are the orange ones, are the ones that are not being monitored sufficiently under the cash jump program. We've got the whole Salinas Valley, we've got, and some of these areas are the ones having just subsidence and, and a ton of pumping, and for them not to be monitoring is pretty egregious, I mean, is what I feel. So we have um, denied some, some grant funds, not too many, <laughs> but, but some, um, and hopefully that'll, that'll happen more as we move forward. I uh, just want to mention again that this data is available on our, our Groundwater um, Information Center. Um, if you go to the right here, there's, there's a number of tabs and you can get reports. And um, some of these contour maps come out of the Northern Region server, so you'll see a link that will take you there and you can download those. So, the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. Um, this is our director here, Mark Cowan. Um, this is a, a, a Anyway, all, all, a lot of the different um, directors, Food and Ag, um, the State Board, Felicia Marcus, um, a big group of folks got together this year and, um, and, and uh, realized we needed to do something for, um, for the, uh, to change the way things were going with groundwater. Um, I was fortunate enough to be able to sit with this group for um, a number of meetings and I was the only technical guy participating in this group and it was pretty interesting to see some of the concepts, you know, that came out of it. Why can't we just do a, you know, um, a pump and trade, you know, where we're, you know, the guys in Tulare Lake want to pump, they can buy credits from the guys in Sacramento Valley, and it's like, it doesn't really work that way. <laughs> you don't just funnel the water down. But, but so, so, you know, it was good to kind of sit in on those meetings, and, I, you know, for the most part, I, I kind of only talk when they ask me to. <laughs> but, these are, these are some pretty smart people, i got to tell you that, though. I mean, they, they are thinking um, out of the box, but, but a lot of times, just because they're unfamiliar with what's going on, um, they need a little course correction. Um, so anyway, just a little history um, on, on how we got to where we are. So in 1992, um, they passed the AB 3030 um, Groundwater Management Act, and what that did is it gave people the authority to develop groundwater management plans, and we saw um, a number of people develop plans but it had a ton of deficiencies. It didn't require they implement the plan, it didn't require they have any goals and objectives, it didn't really require they do anything other than just have this plan on their shelf. Um, 
So that wasn't very good. Um, and then we came up with these uh, local groundwater assistance grants. Um, and this is kind of a chart showing from 1992 um, the, the increase in, in groundwater management plans we're seeing. And this is uh, the, the 303 funding um, that came in. And, and, and the 303 funding was supposed to um, help people develop these plans. And then later on, it was supposed to um, uh, really, uh, if, if you didn't have a plan in place, you weren't going to be eligible to get this funding. Um, it didn't work out all that well because of the requirements for the, you know, when we said, oh, you have to make all the requirements for the groundwater management plan, um, the requirements were, were pretty loose, and so um, people did get funding um, uh, that didn't have uh, plans that were necessarily uh, fully compatible with the water code. Um, anyway, uh, uh, so here we have, this is where the, the eligible for grant funds came in in 2002. This is where um, SB 76, um, the, the CAS gem groundwater monitoring, came into place in 2009. And then um, recently in 2011, we had AB 359, which um, was trying to, to fill some of the gaps and required folks to now look at recharge areas in their plan. So it required people to have um, groundwater recharge maps and submit those maps to us. I think we've gotten about five maps since then. Not very many, um, uh, unfortunately. Um, and then we, um, and so in 2013, as part of the California Water Plan, um, groundwater work we did, uh, we decided to do an inventory, an assessment of all the groundwater management plans um, in California. And I know this is something you think would have been done and, and tracked, but um, literally there's no funding, you know, from our department to do this. We were kind of robbing Peter to pay Paul to, to do these studies. But so anyway, we inventoried all the plans. And we looked at what are the gaps in these plans? You know, what, what's going on? What, why aren't they successful? Because you know, we're, we're looking at the same time, we're looking at this change in storage data, we're realizing that, hey, 20 years after you had the authority to do something, we're seeing huge impacts to these basins. Um, and what we realized is people, ironically, the guys in Tulare Lake and San Joaquin that were doing the most, they, were, um, they had a monitoring grid, they were monitoring, they had models, they were looking at their change in storage every year, they were looking at their land use, they were doing all these things, and they'd come out with annual reports to people, but the annual reports would say, overdraft, you know, 500,000 acre feet this year, and next year, overdraft, you know, 400,000, and just, it just went on and on. And so we asked them, well, what's going on here? I mean, you look like you got the most, you know, funding, you're doing the best work from a technical standpoint, and they're saying, we have no authority to, to control the pumping. We have no authority to limit wells. You know, all we can do is report what it is, and what it is is overdraft. Um, so that was a huge gap. You know, they didn't have the authority. They didn't have funding um, to, to do improvements in some places. Other areas, they didn't have the data they needed. Um, some other areas highlighted technical assistance. They didn't. Um, one of the, the requirements of the older um, uh, the 3030 legislation, which is still effective, is people had identified the um, surface groundwater um, connection and identify how they were monitoring that and how it related to their um, um, impacts and pumping. People had no idea how to do that, so they wanted technical assistance to be able to evaluate the surface water groundwater connection. Um, and then also, um, what came out of that is that everybody said, "Yeah, it's bad," but but we still think local management's better than state management. They felt like they could be more nimble and, and, and make some uh, headway. So, um, and this is the uh, map we did when we did the inventory of plans in, in California, and the uh, dark green, the light green is. Um, post SB 1938 that required, um, SB 1938 was um, uh, the one that required uh, recharge monitoring and, and that type of thing, and that was a, uh, what's the date on that? 2009, I think, anyway. And then these are, are, are um, prior. And you can see that there are a number of areas that had really old plans, never um, updated them. And then, um, and these are some of the statistics for the areas covered and the number of plans. But when I got down here and we looked at all the components that are listed in the water code that people should be doing with SB 1938 compliant plans, only 17% of the groundwater management plans um, met all those requirements. So yeah, that was kind of alarming. And it, you know, it's no, no wonder we were kind of seeing the results we were seeing. Um, so that brings us to legislation this year. Um, uh, you know, there are a couple things it does. I'll, I'll go through those and, and, and highlight them. It requires that groundwater sustainability plan be adopted um, for the most important groundwater basins. One of the things we heard from folks is, you know, there are 515 groundwater basins, and a lot of them, there's no 
people clipping in these basins, and some of them don't pump hardly any water, and so to require groundwater management plans um, for all those basins seemed a little absurd. Um, and so what we did was, um, uh, you know, here we had this calcium basin prioritization sitting on the shelf. And what that showed us is that um, the high and medium priority basins, there are only 127 of them, they accounted for like 92% of the groundwater pumping in California, and they, and they also included like, uh, I think, 91% of the population in California. So we said, okay, if you don't want to do all the basins, just do these 127, and we'll be in pretty good shape. Let's start there. So that was a good that was a good timing. We just finished this, and and so one input that I got that actually for this group that got input in here was was to do the high medium priority basins. Um, the adjudicated basins end up being exempt, um, and mostly those are legal reasons because of uh, going back and changing adjudication after it's been established is is pretty arduous. And, um, but we did um, get in there that they are required to report their use, which in the past they've only had reported locally. Now they have to every year, starting in I think 2017, um, send our department reports of actual their pumping, and we'll be posting those online. Um, as I said, low and very low priority basins are exempt, although they're encouraged to, uh, to develop plans. And the other thing that, that came in here, and we'll talk about a little bit later, um, one of the recognitions is uh, the legislation um, Cashman legislation listed eight components we had to consider for this basin priority. It was groundwater use, irrigated lands, population, um, public supply wells, a whole list of things we had to consider to do this. Um, but uh, it did not include um, impacts to habitat and stream flow. Um, in some of the basins, we included that because I, I knew that these basins had critical um, spring run or, or winter run, and, and there was a good connection. So. Um, there was already a component eight that allowed us to put other you know requirements as needed but um statewide we didn't have that data so by january 2015 right around the corner um, we had to redo this whole prioritization and include um, uh, estimate of impacts to a uh, stream flow or to habitat and stream flow has to be rolled into that um, basin priority so that should be a challenge and we'll be having outreach meetings um to get input on, on on what people think as far as that goes. Um, a little bit of a timeline, it um, establishes a timeline um, uh, for local uh, sustainability agents, uh, agencies. Um, by 2020, any of the basins that we identify as being in overdraft, they have to have a sustainable plan. Um, all the other um, high and medium priority basins that are not in overdraft have a couple more years to, to get their um, act together. And I know this seems like, uh, you know, a long time just to develop a plan, but um, these can be pretty complicated. And then by 2040, all those high and medium priority basins must achieve sustainability. And I know that also seems like a long timeline, but um, you know we're um, we're turning a pretty big ship here that's been moving for a long time in, in the same direction. And so um, yeah, it, it it I I'm still hopeful that that you know people can can work to achieve it for them. But um, even if they if it's done by 2040, I think um, I think that will be a success. The other thing uh, it empowers local agencies agencies to manage their basins sustainably. Like I mentioned, we identified all these gaps for people and reasons why they were saying they couldn't do it. Um, now um, what it did is it takes um, you know so local agencies means any public agency that has water supply, water management, or land use responsibilities within a groundwater basin. And what it, we previously had, we had these water districts that would develop plans or counties or, or water purveyors, um, but they did only the special districts that went through special legislation were able to have these um, enforcement powers and, and other uh, authorities. And so what this, this legislation did was it, it gives these groundwater uh, management, sustainable groundwater management agencies, um, the authority of a special act district without having to go through the legislation. And that lets them enforce rules, adopt and enforce rules, require registration of the groundwater wells. So someday we should be able to go to their groundwater management plan and, and they'll have all their wells identified and we should be able to get the information for that. Um, manage and me measure groundwater extraction, um, reporting and use and assessment of fees. A lot of um, agencies said they didn't have the funding to implement this, um, this uh, act. Um, this lets them charge you know, the ag users to, to do groundwater management which is something they've never had. And then it, um, oh, the other thing here is, is we're gonna look at revising the groundwater basin boundaries. And this is another thing that I 
participated in this group is they were getting a lot of pushback from people. You know, water districts don't follow groundwater basin boundaries. Counties don't follow groundwater basin boundaries. And if you look at the, the basin boundaries um, here, you know, I was uh, fortunate, Glenn and I and others, um, were, were part of the, the divvying up. You know, how, how, how do you um, divide the Central Valley into these sub-basins? Well, these basin boundaries were selected by and large based on, on, on waterways. So here we got Butte Creek, um, and then you get, um, what is this? Uh, this is probably Deer Creek here. And so the thought was at one point, we used to contour these basins and we'd see these bulging you know, contours coming out from the streams that meant these streams were recharging. And our, the thought was, hey, we're gonna wanna do modeling on each of these basins and those make nice no, no flow boundaries. And, and it's a nice little area for people to, to manage. Um, but when you look at it now, all the wells that have gone in, all the multiple perforations, um, we don't see that too much anymore. You still see the, you know, you still see recharge coming from Stony Creek and, and Chico Creek, but, but, you know, there's no real reason, I don't think, to, to keep these boundaries if it means it's going to be more of a challenge for people to manage. So, for instance, if, if Butte County wants to, to do, set up a groundwater management plan, and they want, um, uh, well, they already have theirs by, by basin, but, but if another agency wanted to, we could probably change our basin boundary to make it fit, to let them do management and have a governance structure that makes sense for their area. Um, but that'll be, um, we have to develop regulations for, for doing that, and um, you know, it won't be a willy-nilly thing. Um, uh, you know, we're doing our, our Bolton 118 now every five years, and so the thought was year one of Bolton 118 will open up a solicitation process for people that want to change basin boundaries. We'll look at their argument, look at the data, go back and forth, and on a case-by-case -case basis, we may actually change the basin boundaries. We don't want to do that, you know, off the cuff because a lot of data is already collected by these basin boundaries. And so we want to, you know, honor that. But on the other hand, we want people to be able to manage the basin. Um, so anyway, that's another part of it. The other thing, it, um, oh, so it has some basic requirements for groundwater sustainability plans. Um, description of the physical setting, you'd think that'd be pretty basic, but, but that was something we had to add. Um, identification of groundwater conditions, you know, levels, quality, subsidence, groundwater, surface water interaction, um, historic and projected water demands and supplies. Every um, sustainable groundwater management agency has to develop a budget, which is going to completely change the way we do our work at our department. Um, so we're going to be now be getting data in um, based on these groundwater budgets. So of course, you put together a groundwater budget, you need to know your surface water and your groundwater. So basically, they're doing a, a full-scale analysis there. Um, and this is going to be huge. Um, they have to do maps, make sense. They have to have measurable objectives. That's one thing we saw. Very few plans even had objectives. With milestones, and every year they have to report on whether they've achieved those milestones or whether or not they've, um, uh, how they're doing to, to go towards sustainability. And these are just objectives, you know, you've, you've heard of smart objectives, they need to be specific, they need to be measurable, they need to be accepted by the group, they need to be reasonable, there's no sense in making objectives that you can't obtain, and then they need to be um, true. Um, oh, time bound. Oh, All right, time bound. Okay, that makes sense. So, so um, anyway, um, and then all oh, the other thing is, is a description for those people um, doing their, their standard groundwater management plans, uh, we have to have to relate to the general plan um, in the land use. I mean, that was a big thing that got changed in the last few days. Is we we're trying to figure out how to uh, tie the land use and do um, groundwater management. So that's a huge key. You know, if, if uh, uh, people are, are cities or counties are allowing you know development and they're permitting a ton of wells in an area. Um, it's, it, it can go crossways with maybe a groundwater management plan that says we don't want any more pumping in this area. So when they implement the groundwater management plan, they have to uh, refer to the general plan and they have to coordinate that plan. It um, established a definition of sustainable groundwater management, and that's the management and use of groundwater in a manner that can be managed during the planning and implementation horizon without causing undesirable effects. So this ended up being um, you know, once again, the planning and implementation horizon is about 20, 20 to 40 years in, in places, but, but still, um, you know, it gives them a, a time frame. And then it talked about undesirable results, which was good. A lot of times they give you these definitions of legislation, significant, you know, and those things, and there's no definition. So, 
you know, these are chronic lowering of groundwater levels, you know, significant, well, here we have significant, significant and unreasonable reduction in groundwater storage. So these terms are going to be a little bit of a trick, but significant and unreasonable degradation of quality, you know, land subsidence, um, water depletions. So it, it's going to be up to our department to review these plans, review the data coming out of them, and see whether it is significant and unreasonable um, what's going on there um, as far as sustainable management. Uh, and, and this is where we come in and provide the limited role for the state. Some people would argue it's not so limited, but um, it, you know, obviously one of the things that, that, that everybody wanted was you got to have some backstop. You know, no one, what we've seen so far is very few people take initiative on their own unless they have some threat, you know, that something's going to happen. So we got to have the, the kind of a backstop. And what we agreed upon is DBR is kind of the technical arm agency for the state. So we will do the technical analysis and evaluation assessments. The state board, who's the uh, regulatory enforcement, we would hand it off to them. If we see a basin that's this, um, not being sustainable, they would come in and make some decisions on what needs to be done as far as um, managing it um, themselves or putting it into adjudication. So some of the roles we will evaluate, like I said, sustainability plans. The state board may temporary um, temporarily intervene if, if we uh, make that recommendation. The idea is that it is temporary and that it can be given back to locals, you know, if, if, uh, if they get it together. Um, if not, then it, it would um, continue on over the state board or, or just be adjudicated. Um, also, if the plan is inadequate or if there's no plan after uh, five years, the state board can come in um, or if the local agency has not adequately uh, implemented the plan um, and the basin has problems. Um, as we said, the state board must return control as soon as it can, um, and then the state board may uh, limit temporary control to a portion of the basin not being managed. And the idea there is they, they wouldn't necessarily um, adjudicate the whole basin. If, if you had one part of the basin that was an offender that didn't want to you know, correspond, there's no sense in, in bringing the rest of the folks down. So how are we going to do this? Well, we we're going to take kind of a four-phase approach to, um, to implement this, and, and the first is really just is kind of getting our ducks in, in order, and um, getting the information, and, and, and setting out our clear ex expectation as to what we think people should um, have in their plan and how to do that. Um, we're also going to um, establish some uh, guidelines for local governance structure um, to support, support sustainable management, and then um, and as, as we move forward, um, we'll uh, will set up the intent and design for sustainable groundwater management programs, and then um, finally in phase four we'll be implementing those programs in, in 2020. Um, so it's kind of a you know a little bit of a, a phase. Oh, did I? Sorry, I have a timeline. I was going to drop off you guys. You want to hand this one out? Um, so this is a kind of a timeline of the plan. But um, and the other thing we're going to do is we've decided to break uh, our program into these uh, functional areas. And uh, really, first we got to assess the, uh, the sustainability of the basin. Um, we need to evaluate whether um, how we're providing technical assistance or if we're going to do that. Um, and planning assistance. Um, we also, our department by and large, um, has a lot of planners, so we can, we can help them in that regard. Um, financial um, and regional planning assistance. The idea there is that you know people are going to need money to implement this plan and, and a new um, water bond. Um, there's money in there that our department would give out for grants and loans for, for agencies to implement this plan. And then just interregional assistance. Um, and the idea there is maybe um, through some of these IRWM groups, getting them to coordinate and providing assistance there. Um, so we'll support locally developed groundwater sustainability plans by um, developing basin budgets, boundaries, um, we'll prioritize the basins, um, we'll have a, a kind of a guidance document for governance structures that will work, um, and we'll do assessments of uh, groundwater sustainability plans, and those assessments will be posted online. We're going to provide technical assistance um, through groundwater management information system. We're going to take our um, you know, our groundwater uh, uh, website and really um, revamp that in order to be able to collect some of the reporting data that's coming in and, and let people download that. Um, and then uh, we're going to continue to, to implement the cash gen program, which requires groundwater to be monitored, and we'll continue to do our analysis like I showed with the contour maps. 
And then um, we'll also be doing some planning assistance. Um, and this is mostly a Volt 118. We'll be updating that now every five years. We finally got the funding to do that. That's going to tie into the water plan. Uh, Volt 118, the way it's set up is that it's supposed to be done in years ending in 0 and 5. And then the water plan is supposed to be done in years ending in 3 and 8. So ideally, our Volt 118 document, which is assessment of the groundwater conditions, will come out three years before the California water plan. And then the California water plan will take that data and recommendations and put it into the planning for, for the future. So getting those back in sync, I think, will be really important. Um, and then financial and regional assistance, like I said, we're we'll, uh, we'll going to have a couple of grant and loans programs to give out money um, and, and provide um, assistance for folks that way. And then interregional assistance, we talked about that. But um, uh, oh, oh. So this is uh, improved surface water reliability. There's a number of things that go on there, but assess surface and groundwater interaction. One of the last days of, this, of the legislation, um, I was watching this daily, but they're just all these little zingers kept coming in. I'm like, oh, where'd that come from? Um, our department, um, they gave us the job by, I want to say, 2017, to identify all the water in California available for groundwater replenishment. And I'm like, wow, that's quite, quite a job. You know, not only um, is it's, it's highly variable, depending on water your type and, and, and everything, but a lot of the water, even if it's available, State board has rules on whether you can recharge it, um, and, and they require that your water right have um, recharge as a beneficial use. And many of the really old water rights only have agriculture as their beneficial use of that water. So even though there could be excess water um, legally, they're not supposed to recharge it. So that's one of the things we'll work, talk with the board about too is maybe improve that that system a little bit so that some flood flows can that water can go to recharge. In, in key areas. So this is just the uh, the near term stuff on the um, on the handout I gave you. And like I said, in 2015, right around the corner, we got to update the basin prioritization. And these orange are BWR actions. The blue is the water board, and um, purple is is the uh, our joint actions by both of us, and then the local action. Um, but then we also um, uh, Next year, we identify a basin subject to um, critical conditions of overdraft. Um, that's going to be probably a year-long process with workshops. We're going to set up a process that people can comment on for, for determining if they're in overdraft. And it's unfortunate that the legislation gives us this definition, which has kind of been stuck in the mud, but um, subject to critical conditions of overdraft. So my hope is that yeah, so my hope is not just to say you've gone from zero to critical. Um, we're hoping to set up a, a process where, you know, basins can be identified as being in balance, you know, periodically balanced, overdrafted, critically overdrafted. So, so when we analyze these 127 high and, prior, high and medium priority basins, people will know, hey, we already think we're overdrafted and we're, you know, we could be heading towards critical or, or whatever. Um, in, in next year, um, we have to have regulations for the basin boundaries, which I'm not sure the why they decided the regulations. You know, typically we do guidance documents, but um, and then we have to um, adopt also regulations for evaluating these plans. And this is kind of our opportunity to uh, take some of those plan requirements and and um, and look at whether or not they make sense and and what we really need from these plans. So. Um, anyway, this is going to be, uh, this is probably going to be the meat and potatoes, I think, of, of, of what we're doing is, is really defining how these basins will be evaluated and what goes into their plans to um, do that. And then we have, um, this is where we uh, publish report on the, um, yeah, the water availability, surface water availability for uh, groundwater replenishment. And then we, in 2017, we decided even though even though Volt 118 is only uh, in years ending in, in 0 and 5, people need uh, some sort of document to summarize this. And so by then, we'll have all of our basins updated. We'll have the process for determining basin boundaries. And we'll have a new set of basin boundaries. And we'll have these guidelines. And the thought is that in 2017, we'll put all those in our Volt 118 to do a kind of a mini assessment just so everybody's on the same page. Because that same year, people have to form their groundwater sustainability agencies. Um, 
So this is a really busy time for us. We also have guidelines. Um, uh, oh, that's the water for availability. So the next few years are really busy for us. Then, then the um, locals start doing their thing, and then you'll see in that handout, that's when, later on when the water board comes in if they're not able to achieve sustainability. It's just a, a long-term one, I'm not gonna go over that. Um, and then, of course, we gotta do a ton of outreach and agency alignment. Um, you know, the state board and DWR are kind of two leading agencies, and we haven't always played very well together. You know, we're always in competition, trying to get funds, trying to, you know, so really, it's it's good. We uh, Mark and Mark Cowan, our director, and Felicia Marcus have really made a commitment to do that. So we're setting up technical teams that will probably meet on a regular basis to talk about you know, what they're doing, what we're doing. Um, prior to the, the legislation determining that DWR had the technical lead, the state board last year put in a budget proposal for nine new positions to do groundwater management plan assessments. <laughs> it's not have nine people that need work to do, but that's our job. So. And anyway, we're trying to coordinate right now on what, what they can do, and, and really um, we're hoping that maybe they could help with that surface water assignment, or you know, one thing we really need is by groundwater basin boundaries uh, um, to determine what is the real water quality situation in some of these basins. And so uh, that's another thing that they may be helping with. But anyway, we'll see much more alignment of the, of the agencies needing to work together. So in summary, it's gonna establish a new statewide policy for sustainable management, requires sustainable groundwater management for high and medium priority basins, establishes the basic components for the plans, gives the local agencies the authorities they need to, to do this, um, and it does not alter or determine any uh, surface water rights, the key part that people want in there, and it does not alter the state water resources control board's um, existing authority over the current law. Um, previous versions did have quite a few changes in there. And then it also provides for a temporary state intervention um, in limited circumstances. And I want to throw this one in here. Um, I'm not sure very many of you are familiar with the California Water Action Plan. It came out um, January of this year, but it's a great read. It's, it's real short, maybe 25 pages, but they have 10 actions in there. And each of those actions have a bunch of sub components. And uh, the governor, um, probably one of the best ideas I've seen in my career that came out because, you know, agency to agency we all did our own thing and, and you know we had our own goals and objectives but what this does it takes all the agencies and it says the government says this is what you will work towards and so we're actually really revamping our programs and, and uh, our programs are the goals and objectives of this uh, um, Brower, um California water action plan which ultimately that plan is to achieve sustainability of our resources and to restore those, those environmental systems that have been degraded so that's, that's great. From, from the executive level in our department all the way down to staff level, we want to make sure people know that if they're out measuring a well, they know how that relates to the goals and objectives of that plan. Um, and this is probably, I mean, it, it seems so simple, but it, it's, it's a document that unifies everybody and gives us a goal to work towards. And I think it's, um, you know, the goal of sustainability is something we just haven't had for a long time. So I, I'm really excited about it, and I think a lot of uh, our staff are excited to so anyway, long, long talk. Sorry. <laughs> of a, 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 a push to get them involved or get it included in this legislation, but they um, they made a commitment and they're already meeting on how they can change those adjudication laws to require the basins to adjudicate the basins to do something similar. It'll just be on a separate track, maybe a different timeline. 
So one of those 127 became adjudicated before 2020, would they be on, which, which track would they might be on? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, well, it's one thing is adjudication process takes long. 10 years, probably minimum. It, and, and so, um, but we have had people say, wow, it's a lot of work, we don't want to do that, can we just go adjudication? And, and so they're also looking at ways to uh, maybe expedite that adjudication process, but not give them a pass on the sustainability requirement. Mm -hmm. So I think any, any basin that goes adjudication from here on out will have to incorporate these same requirements. One, one of the, so if one of the other counties that's not a higher median priority, if they become higher median priority, are they going to have to get their, yeah. uh, their document by 2020 or 2022? Yeah, so that's another trick, because one of the things I, I noticed in this timeline, I've been trying to bring it up, and, and it hasn't gotten much traction so far, is we want to give people time to organize their areas. And um, by the time we get our um, basins reprioritized, and, and then we have to, when we redo the basin boundaries, that affects the prioritization, because all the data gets re redone. Mm -hmm. um, and so they're going to end up, we're going to end up with some of the low basins, but when we start looking at um, whether they have impacts to habitat and stream flow, they're going to become medium priority all of a sudden. So yeah, those those people that it's not on the radar right now, are, are right now they have to follow the same schedule. It's just that they're not going to know for like another year and a half. Yeah. Um, so anyway, but it, it goes on. There's a tremendous amount of work for DWR. Are there plans to hire and get help? <laughs> yeah, so we've got a, um, we um, had a, a budget change proposal put in last year that they gave us five new positions this year, and then next year we get another five new positions, and then um, just kind of had a, a big uh, meeting yesterday actually talking about how we're going to do this, and, and, uh, and, and my hope was not to do no offense to the consultant world, but you know, I was hoping we could, you know, build up from the inside and, and get that expertise going. But, but it does look like, you know, at the stop gap, we are going to probably have a contracts with consulting firms to kind of help with some of this. But um, and then we have another um, uh, budget change proposal coming in the following year. Um, and it was tough. We're trying to put these together. We knew it was coming. We, need, we knew we needed positions, but we didn't know until September 16th what exactly we needed to do. Um, and that whole surface water thing, we're like, wow, there's five over the years, you know, trying to figure that out. Um, so yeah, we will need more people. We'll be doing more hiring. So yeah, you guys, um, we're not. I know we're often um, equated with the, you know, the uh, dark side, but um, and that's because we have the state water project, and and we do have to recognize that in, in what we do. But but I, uh, you know, there's. I, I feel pretty positive about our department now, given the edict of you know really doing sustainable planning. So we look forward for um, some of you guys maybe uh, you know, come in as students, and, and we try to get people in as students. And then I, I started as a student, and uh, and then work into full time positions. We just hired a new engineering job two weeks ago. So let me go back to your first. Go ahead. Well, yeah, so I have the one slide where it gave a definition. You have to, you can't just be, um, if you have, there's a definition of an agency. I'm trying to figure that out what that was. Local agency, here we go. So if any um, local um, public agency that has a water supply, water management, or land use um, responsibilities. Right. So it could be a case where you have three agencies saying I'm the one. It's another problem no, deal with. Yeah, so when we're writing this, we're thinking, oh gosh, no one's going to want to do this. And all of a sudden, we're yeah. realizing that some basins, it's, it's like a race. You know, hey, can we get ours in first? You know, we want to be the, the lead. And, and so somehow we're going to have to decide um, who gets to be the lead, you know, in, in some of these basins. And, and you know, we're not going to, the idea is not to divide this up into a ton of small. Plans. I mean, we want the plans to be the biggest possible. That's the only way to really effectively manage. And so, you know, if we get three applications you know, right next to each other for small areas, we're going to say, go back and talk it over and come back with one plan. Um, that's my feeling. Um, and hopefully we'll, we'll be able to do that. Because it doesn't say we can't do that, but that's going to be part of the regulation part that we put together. I think we have to have some guidance there on, on what is the minimum size we really want and, and how you can coordinate. 
So Del Oro and PID are, are okay. Yeah, well, speak of PID. Yeah, so so it's interesting. Um, they're not in a groundwater basin. They're not. Yeah, and so, um, but the, um, so, so the original thought of this thing too was let's just do it for all of California. We don't necessarily need to worry about groundwater basins. Right, and, recharge. Yeah, but, but it ended up going back to the groundwater basin boundaries. So, um, you know, I think the uh, the surface water agencies have, have their own, ish, you know, um, requirements. You know, they have 20 by 2020, they have to reduce 20% um, by 2020. They, they have some other um, things they're trying to do to improve their sustainability. Um, um, but yeah, they are not, if you're in a hard rock area, you don't necessarily have to um, abide by this. Interesting. Yeah. Right. And currently they're in the order to allow rainwaters to flow through, so. Well, that was the state board, yeah, put that in there. And that was a, a part of the curtailment, is they said that, you know, the streams need it, and so they can't capture that flow um, behind their dam um, anyway, until, until it's lifted, yeah. Of, as far as management of the groundwater uh -huh. resources, is it just a matter of managing the chronic loss of the levels, or is there going to be some differentiation for uh, the areas depending upon what that groundwater supports? For instance, if it supports a forested area versus groundwater that's being pumped out to irrigate um, yeah. Uh, range land or agricultural land. So I mean, I'm thinking about the trees around here. I mean, how deep can the aquifer go before the trees can't access it anymore? Probably, yeah, what, 100 feet? 150 feet? I don't know. I'm, I'm looking to Bruce back a little bit. Well, I'm just thinking that that's not, a variation yeah. in the management plan. So, so it's up to the local to determine what their goals and objectives are, but, but clearly there's going to need to be some um, critical thinking as far as, you know, how they evaluate that. And, and they put in here, they don't want to race to the, what they call the race to the pump house, everybody quit putting in wells. You know, they want to say after this day, you know, no new wells or, or you have to go through the process. But, um, uh, you know, part of the problem that we see um, is all the filling of ag weed that's happened on the, on the borders of the valley. And so we've heard a number of these districts going, no, we were just fine until, you know, they, they put, you know, a thousand acres along the edge of the basement never had any um, pumping before. Now they're capturing all the recharge that we used to get. Now we're, our levels are declining. So there, I mean, some of the thoughts were, well, those would be the first one to be kicked, kicked out and not be able to pump. You know, if, if they're going to have to put requirements on pumping. No, but there is going to need to be some consideration for, um, for just the recharge, you know. If, if, if a particular area has got much greater natural recharge than another area, I mean, you shouldn't be pumping the same in both those areas. So it, it's a that's a big um, assignment for the locals, and, and hopefully we can give them some direction there. But but in the it, nowhere in here to say almonds are better than tomatoes, mm -hmm. you know, cotton's better than this, and there's no judgment calls that. Or way. the native part. Or the environment's better than um, yeah, and it wasn't until the end, like I said, until mm -hmm. they um, put in the uh, impacts to habitat stream flow. But that's a huge huge thing now, you know, and, and we're seeing it. Yeah, well, this is how it happened with Big Chico Creek this year and, and a lot of the, the, the creeks. I mean, they um, are dried really early. Um, so, um, yeah, I mean, we want to try to, to, to minimize those impacts if we can. When these agencies are putting together their plans for sustainability, are they using 2014 groundwater levels? Are they using 2004? Yeah. Are they using um, what's convenient? Like, what? I mean, I know that you're going to your agency is going to be looking at that for something reasonable. Right. So, I don't even know what reasonable is. Yeah, well, so the, to think that Larry Lake's going to end up getting to a point where, you know, their surface water, groundwater is interacting, you know, <laughs> in some sort of natural way is, is kind of a, a push. I mean, I, I don't know what that would mean. Our hope there is that they stabilize and maybe recover some. So, yeah, in, in those areas, you know, their goal may be just to, to, to have a stable water level, you know, um, and with some recovery, but yeah, sustainability, um, obviously we don't run on different definitions for each basin, and, and we got to have, um, uh, yeah, that would be a nightmare, but, um, you know, it, it, it does need to be tailored a little bit to be reasonable um, for some areas. I mean, they're, they're 600 feet of groundwater in some places, so, you know, 
think they're going to get back up to 100 feet in the next 20 years is probably not realistic. Um, but yeah, I, and that's going to be a, 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 another tough question, and, and we'll be looking at that and we do our regulations for that. Mm -hmm. Oh, go ahead. I had a question regarding the Glen Coos Irrigation District. Uh -huh. The meeting that happened on October 7th. And, um, the one in Glen? The one in um, the Ord community. Yeah, right, right. And <clears throat> so what I got from that meeting was that, and your presentation today, is that Glen Clusa is experiencing extreme um, overdraft, or critical overdraft right now. Yeah, uh, well, uh, yeah, I mean, I, we haven't called it um, critical yet, okay. but it, it, there, there's definitely, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's no doubt about it that west side of the basin is an overdraft. And so um, their uh, proposed project was to input five new wells, and that seems to be getting them in trouble, or um, I yeah. mean, it's upsetting a lot of farmers, and I'm just curious with, um, with your thoughts on how they should proceed, or if they are even included in the sustainable yeah. um, plan. So, so they're, you know, they're a big irrigation district, and, and they have a... a pre-1914 water rights, um, but they still can get cut back. And so they got cut back this year, and they thought, you know, just by slim margin, they thought they were gonna get cut back even more, but they didn't. Um, and so their initial um, goal, I think, is to have wells that can make up supply during cutbacks, but then we also have the long-term water transfer program that's right. being proposed by the Bureau, which could, you know, end up with cutbacks annually and then, you know, then they're pumping annually. And so we see now that, um, you know, even the deep aquifer um, is, is having impacts in areas, so. Like the, the representatives from Aqua Alliance were saying that we did need to um, take into account the extreme pressures going on in the San Joaquin, the Delta, and down south, and this whole um, lend a hand program for the drought. However, if orchards, not, like, if, Northern California is a better place to grow crops than in the San Joaquin Valley, and that's what they're actually doing in Central Valley, is uprooting old orchards. Mm -hmm. And if we want to plant some here, why can't we allocate to keep more water here for agricultural purposes if it just is more of a... Um, so uh, water water is over allocated by about five times. Right. You know? So, so there's no more water really to allocate, and then it is a huge philosophical question: is so why should they be allowed to grow crops there when you know we're cutting back and following here? Um, and I don't know the answer to that, but I would say um, you know the long-term water transfer um, EIR EIS is available online. Yeah. They had a meeting here in Chico last week or so about that, and so I mean that's something that consider because that is well, one the of comment the comment cutoff is on the 31st. What's that? The comment cutoff is on the 31st. Of uh, not this month. Of this month. Oh, is it this month? I don't yes. think so. I think it's November. Are you sure? I, really? I thought it was. Maybe. I mean, I might have yeah. noted. Yeah, because that would be like. Right. Yeah. Right. But I thought they just said 30. Yeah. Like 30 days. So, so anyway, yeah, I mean, look at that document. I mean, there are there are some things I think we're going to have to, you know, I live in the North State too, and we don't want to see all of our, our streams go dry so that Southern California can necessarily and have crops. Just one I'm just going to, I'm just going to oh. cut things off re oh. right quick. We're already like way beyond yeah, what our, no, 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 no problem. Yes. I think Dan will be willing to hang out and chat with folks afterwards, but I just want everyone to have a chance to thank him again for coming. Thank you.